Prologue, Autobiography of an Epidemic It's a Sunday Night, 10 p.m. Head up against the glass of an Uber. Too tired to even sit up straight. I taught six times today, yes, six. The church I pastor just added another gathering. That's what you do, right? Make room for people. I made it until about talk number four. I don't remember anything after that. I'm well beyond tired, emotionally, mentally, even spiritually. When we first went to six, I called up this megachurch pastor in California who'd been doing six for a while. How do you do it? I asked. Easy, he said. It's just like running a marathon once a week. Okay, thanks. Click. Wait, isn't a marathon really hard? I take up long distance running. He has an affair and drops out of church. That does not bode well for my future. Home now, late dinner. Can't sleep, that dead tired but wired feeling. Crack open a beer. On the couch, watching an obscure kung fu movie nobody's ever heard of. Chinese, with subtitles. Keanu Reeves is the bad guy one love Keanu. I sigh, lately, I'm ending most nights this way. On the couch, long after the family has gone to bed. Never been remotely into kung fu before. It makes me nervous. Is this the harbinger of mental illness on the horizon? It all started when he got obsessed with indie martial arts movies. But the thing is, I feel like a ghost. Half alive, half dead. More numb than anything else. Flat, one-dimensional. Emotionally I live with an undercurrent of a non-stop anxiety that rarely goes away. And a tinge of sadness. But mostly I just feel blah spiritually. Empty. It's like my soul is hollow. My life is so fast. And I like fast. I'm type of driven. A get crap done kind of guy. But we're well past that now. I work six days a week, early to late and it's still not enough time to get it all done. Worse, I feel hurried. Like I'm tearing through each day, so busy with life that I'm missing out on the moment. And what is life but a series of moments? Anybody, I can't be the only one. Monday morning, up early, in a hurry to get to the office. Always in a hurry. Another day of meetings. I freaking hate meetings. I'm introverted and creative, and like most millennials I get bored way too easily. Me in a lot of meetings is a terrible idea for all involved. But our church grew really fast, and that's part of the trouble. I hesitate to say this because, trust me, if anything, it's embarrassing. We grew by over a thousand people a year for seven years straight. I thought this was what I wanted. I mean, a fast-growing church is every pastor's dream. But some lessons are best learned the hard way, turns out. I don't actually want to be the CEO, executive director of a nonprofit, HR expert, strategy guru, leader of leaders of leaders, etc. I got into this thing to teach the way of Jesus. Is this the way of Jesus? Speaking of Jesus, I have this terrifying thought lurking at the back of my mind. This nagging question of conscience that won't go away. Who am I becoming? I just hit 30, so I have a little time under my belt. Enough to chart a trajectory to plot the character arc of my life a few decades down the road. I stop, breathe, envision myself at 40, 50, 60. It's not pretty. I see a man who is successful, but by all the wrong metrics, church size, book sales, speaking invites, social stats, etc., and the new American dream, your own Wikipedia page. In spite of all my talk about Jesus, I see a man who is emotionally unhealthy and spiritually shallow. I'm still in my marriage, but it's duty, not delight. My kids want nothing to do with the church. She was the mistress of choice for dad, an illicit lover I ran to, to hide from the pain of my wound. I'm basically who I am today but older and worse, stressed out, on edge, quick to snap at the people I love most. Unhappy, preaching a way of life that sounds better than it actually is. Oh, and always in a hurry. Why am I in such a rush to become somebody I don't even like? It hits me like a freight train. In America you can be a success as a pastor and a failure as an apprentice of Jesus. You can gain a church and lose your soul. I don't want this to be my life. Fast forward three months, flying home from London. Spent the week learning from my charismatic Anglican friends about life in the spirit. It's like a whole other dimension to reality that I've been missing out on. But with each mile east, I'm flying back to a life I dread. The night before we left, this guy Ken prayed for me in his posh English accent. He had a word for me about coming to a fork in the road. One road was paved and led to a city with lights. Another was a dirt road into a forest. It led into the dark, into the unknown. I'm to take the unpaved road. I have absolutely no idea what it means. But it means something, I know. As he said it, I felt my soul tremor under God. But what is God saying to me? Catching up on email, planes are good for that. I'm behind, as usual. Bad news again, a number of staff are upset with me. I'm starting to question the whole megachurch thing. Not so much the size of a church but the way of doing church too is this really it. A bunch of people coming to listen to a talk and then going back to their overbusy lives. But my questions come off angry and arrogant. I'm so emotionally unhealthy, I'm just leaking chemical waste over our poor staff. What's that leadership axiom? As go the leaders, so goes the church three dang. I sure hope our church doesn't end up like me. Sitting in aisle seat 21 degrees Celsius musing over how to answer another tense email. 
a virgin thought comes to the surface of my mind. Maybe it's the thin atmosphere of 30,000 feet, but I don't think so. This thought has been trying to break out for months, if not years, but I've not let it. It's too dangerous, too much of a threat to the status quo. But the time has come for it to be uncaged, let loose in the wild. Here it is, what if I changed my life? Another three months and a thousand hard conversations later. Dragging every pastor and mentor and friend and family member into the vortex of the most important decision I've ever made. I'm sitting in an elder meeting. Dinner is over. It's just me and our core leaders. This is the moment. From here on, my autobiography will fall into the before or after category. I say it, I resign. Well, not resign per se, and not quitting. We're a multi-site church. Our largest church is in the suburbs. I've spent the last 10 years of my life there. But my heart's always been in the city. All the way back to high school, I remember driving my 77 Volkswagen bus up and down 23rd Street and dreaming of church planting downtown for our church in the city is smaller. Much smaller. On way harder ground, urban Portland is a secular wonderland. All the cards are against you down here. But that's where I feel the gravity of the spirit weighing on me to touch down. So not resign, more like demote myself. I want to lead one church at a time. Novel concept, right. My dream is to slow down, simplify my life around abiding. Walk to work. I want to reset the metrics for success. I say, I want to focus more on who I am becoming an apprenticeship to Jesus. Can I do that? They say yes. People will talk. They always do. He couldn't hack it. Wasn't smart enough. Wasn't tough enough. Or here's one I will get for months. He's turning his back on God's call on his life. Wasting his gift in obscurity. Farewell. Let them talk. I have new metrics now. I end my 10-year run at the church. My family and I take a sabbatical. It's a sheer act of grace. I spend the first half comatose, but slowly I wake back up to my soul. I come back to a much smaller church. We move into the city. I walk to work. I start therapy. One word, wow. Turns out, I need a lot of it. I focus on emotional health. Work fewer hours. Date my wife. Play Star Wars Legos with my kids. Practice Sabbath. Detox from Netflix. Start reading fiction for the first time since high school. Walk the dog before bed. You know, live. Sounds great, right. Utopian even. Hardly. I feel more like a drug addict coming off meth. Who am I without the mega? A queue of people who want to meet with me. A late night email flurry. A life of speed isn't easy to walk away from. But in time, I detox. Feel my soul open up. There are no fireworks in the sky. Change is slow, gradual, and intermittent. Three steps forward, a step or two back. Some days I nail it, others, I slip back into hurry. But for the first time in years, I'm moving toward maturity. One inch at a time, becoming more like Jesus, and more like my best self. Even better, I feel God again. I feel my own soul. I'm on the unpaved road with no clue where it leads, but that's okay. I honestly value who I'm becoming over where I end up. And for the first time in years, I'm smiling at the horizon. My Uber ride home to binge watch Keanu Reeves was five years and as many lifetimes ago. So much has changed since then. This little book was born out of my short and mostly uneventful autobiography. My journey from a life of hurry to a life of, well, something else. In a way, I'm the worst person to write about hurry. I'm the guy angling at the stoplight for the lane with two cars instead of three. The guy bragging about being the first to the office. Last to go home. The fast walking, fast talking, chronic multitasking speed addict. Or at least I was. Not anymore. I found an off-ramp from that life. So maybe I'm the best person to write a book on hurry. You decide. I don't know your story. The odds are, you aren't a former megachurch pastor who burned out and had a midlife crisis at age 33. It's more likely that you're a college student at USD or a 20-something urbanite in Chicago or a full-time mom in Melbourne or a middle-aged insurance broker in Minnesota. Getting started in life or just trying to keep going. A Korean-born German philosopher Byung Chul Han ends his book The Burnout Society with a haunting observation of most people in the Western world. They are too alive to die, and too dead to live five that was me to the proverbial tea is it you, even a little. We all have our own story of trying to stay sane in the day and age of iPhones and Wi-Fi and the 24-hour news cycle and urbanization and 10-lane freeways with soul-crushing traffic and non-stop noise and a frenetic 90 miles per hour life of go, go, go. Think of this book like you and me meeting up for a cup of Portland coffee and me downloading everything I've learned over the last few years about how to navigate the treacherous waters of what French philosopher Jules Lepofsky calls hypermodern world six but honestly. Everything I have to offer you, I'm stealing from the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. My rabbi. And so much more. My favorite invitation of Jesus comes to us via Matthew's Gospel. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Seven, do you feel weary? What about burdened? 
Anybody feel a bone-deep tiredness not just in your mind or body but in your soul? If so, you're not alone. Jesus invites all of us to take up the easy yoke. He has, on offer to all, an easy way to shoulder the weight of life with his triumvirate of love, joy, and peace. As Eugene Peterson translated Jesus' iconic line, to live freely and lightly ate what if the secret to a happy life. And it is a secret, an open one but a secret nonetheless. How else do so few people know it? What if the secret isn't out there but much closer to home? What if all you had to do was slow down long enough for the merry-go-round blur of life to come into focus? What if the secret to the life we crave is actually easy? Now, let me clarify a few things before we begin. First, I'm not you. While glaringly obvious, it needs to be said. I'm guessing this anti-hurry manifesto will grate on some of you. It did on me at first. It exposes the deep ache in all of us for a life that is different from the one we're currently living. The temptation will be to write me off as unrealistic or out of touch. He has no idea what it's like to be a single mom working two jobs just trying to pay off debt and make rent each week. You're right, I don't. He's woefully out of touch with life as an executive in the social Darwinism of the marketplace. It might be true. He doesn't get what it's like in my city, nation, generation. I might not. I simply ask you to hear me out. Secondly, I'm not Jesus. Just one of his many apprentices who have been at it for a while. Again, obvious. My agenda for our time together is simple pass on some of the best things I've learned from sitting at the feet of the Master. A man whose closest friends all said he was anointed with the oil of joy more than any of his companions nine my translation. He was the happiest person alive. Most of us don't even think to look to Jesus for advice on how to be happy. For that we look to the Dalai Lama or our local mindfulness studio or Tal Ben Shahar's positive psychology class at Harvard. They all have good things to say, and for that I'm grateful. But Jesus is in a class of his own. Hold him up against any teacher tradition, or philosophy, religious or secular, ancient or modern, from Socrates to the Buddha to Nietzsche to your yogi podcaster of choice. For me Jesus remains the most brilliant, most insightful, most thought-provoking teacher to ever walk the earth, and he walked slowly. So rather than buckle up, settle in. On that note, finally, let me say it straight up, if you want fast and faster. This isn't the book for you. In fact, you don't really have time to read a book, maybe skim the first chapter. Then you'd better get back at it. If you want a quick fix or a three-step formula and an easy acronym, this book isn't for you either. There's no silver bullet for life, no life hack for the soul. Life is extraordinarily complex. Change is even more so. Anybody who says differently is selling you something. But, if you're weary, if you're tired of life as you know it, if you have a sneaking suspicion that there might be a better way to be human, that you might be missing the whole point, that the metrics for success our culture handed you might be skewed, that said success might turn out to look a lot like failure. Above all, if your time has come and you're ready to go on a counterintuitive and very countercultural journey to explore your soul in the reality of the kingdom, then enjoy the read. This book isn't long or hard to understand, but we have secrets to tell. Part 1. The Problem Hurry, the great enemy of spiritual life last week I had lunch with my mentor John. Okay, confession, he's not actually my mentor, he's way out of my league, but we regularly have lunch and I ask a barrage of questions about life. Notepad open. John is the kind of person you meet and immediately think, I want to be like that when I grow up. He's blisteringly smart but more, wise. Yet he never comes off remotely pretentious or stuck up. Instead, he's joyful, easygoing, comfortable in his own skin. A raging success, kind, curious, present to you in the moment. Basically, he's a lot like how I imagine Jesus when John happens to be a pastor and writer in California who was mentored by another hero of mine, Dallas Willard. If you don't know that name, you're welcome to Willard was a philosopher at the University of Southern California, but is best known outside academia as a teacher of the way of Jesus, more than any teacher outside the library of scripture. His writings have shaped the way I follow, or as he would say, Apprentice under, Jesus three all that to say, John was a mentee of Willard for over twenty years. Until Willard's death in 2013, I never got the chance to meet Willard, so the first time John and I sat down in Menlo Park, I immediately started pumping him for stories. We hit gold. Here's one I just can't stop thinking about. John calls up Dallas to ask for advice. It's the late 90 seconds, and at the time John was working at Willow Creek Community Church in Chicago, one of the most influential churches in the world. John himself is a well-known teacher and best-selling author. The kind of guy you figure pretty much has apprenticeship to Jesus down. But behind the scenes he felt like he was getting sucked into the vortex of megachurch insanity. I could relate. So he calls up Willard and asks, What do I need to do to become the me I want to be? For there's a long silence on the other end of the line. According to John, with Willard there's always a long silence on the other end of the line. Then, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Can we just hit stop for a minute and agree? That's brilliant. 
Thanks, John then scribbles that line down in his journal. Sadly, this was before Twitter. Otherwise, that would have broken the internet. Then he asks, okay, what else? Another long silence. Willard, there is nothing else. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. End of story 5 When I first heard that, I felt a deep resonance with reality. Hurry is the root problem underneath so many of the symptoms of toxicity in our world. And yet Willard's reply is not what I would expect. I live in one of the most secular, progressive cities in America. But if you were to ask me, what is the great challenge to your spiritual life in Portland? I'm not sure what I'd say. Most likely I'd say it's modernity or postmodernity or liberal theology or the popularization of the prosperity gospel or the redefinition of sexuality and marriage or the erasure of gender or internet porn or the millions of questions people have about violence in the Old Testament or the fall of celebrity pastors or Donald Trump. I don't know. How would you answer that question? I bet very few of us would default to hurry as our answer. But read the Bible. Satan doesn't show up as a demon with a pitchfork and gravelly smoker voice or as Will Ferrell with an electric guitar and fire on Saturday Night Live. He's far more intelligent than we give him credit for. Today, you're far more likely to run into the enemy in the form of an alert on your phone while you're reading your Bible or a multi-day Netflix binge or a full-on dopamine addiction to Instagram or a set of morning at the office or another sock game on a Sunday or commitment after commitment after commitment in a life of speed. Corey Ten Boom once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. There's truth in that. Both sin and busyness have the exact same effect. They cut off your connection to God, to other people, and even to your own soul. The famous psychologist Carl Jung had this little saying, hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. Jung, by the way, was the psychologist who developed the framework of the introvert and extrovert personality types and whose work later became the basis for the Myers-Briggs type indicator test. Suffice to say, he knew what he was talking about. Recently I was running the vision of our church by my therapist, who is this Jesus-loving. Uber Smart PhD. Our dream was to re-architect our communities around apprenticeship to Jesus. He loved it but kept saying the same thing. The number one problem you will face is time. People are just too busy to live emotionally healthy and spiritually rich and vibrant lives. What do people normally answer when you ask the customary, how are you? Oh, good, just busy. Pay attention and you'll find this answer everywhere, across ethnicity, gender, stage of life, even class, college students are busy. Young parents are busy. Empty nesters living on a golf course are busy. CEOs are busy, so are baristas and part-time nanas. Americans are busy. Kiwis are busy. Germans are busy. We're all busy. Granted, there is a healthy kind of busyness where your life is full with things that matter. Not wasted on empty leisure or trivial pursuits. By that definition, Jesus himself was busy. The problem isn't when you have a lot to do. It's when you have too much to do and the only way to keep the quota up is to hurry. That kind of busy is what has us all reeling. Michael Zigarelli from the Charleston Southern University School of Business conducted the Obstacles to Growth survey of over 20,000 Christians across the globe and identified busyness as a major distraction from spiritual life. Listen carefully to his hypothesis. It may be the case that Christians are assimilating to a culture of busyness, hurry and overload which leads to God becoming more marginalized in Christians' lives, which leads to a deteriorating relationship with God, which leads to Christians becoming even more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions about how to live, which leads to more conformity to a culture of busyness, hurry and overload. And then the cycle begins again six and pastors, by the way, are the worst. He rated busyness in my profession right up there with lawyers and doctors. I mean, not me, other pastors. As the Finnish proverb so eloquently quips, God did not create hurry. This new speed of life isn't Christian, it's anti-Christ. Think about it, what has the highest value in Christ's kingdom economy? Easy, love. Jesus made that crystal clear. He said the greatest command in all of the Torah was to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength, followed only by, love your neighbor as yourself seven but love is painfully time-consuming. All parents know this, as do all lovers and most long-term friends. Hurry and love are incompatible. All my worst moments as a father, a husband, and a pastor, even as a human being, are when I'm in a hurry, late for an appointment, behind on my unrealistic to-do list, trying to cram too much into my day. I use anger, tension, a critical nagging, the antitheses of love. If you don't believe me, next time you're trying to get your type B wife and three young, easily distracted children out of the house and you're running late, just pay attention to how you relate to them. Does it look and feel like love? Or is it far more in the vein of agitation, anger, a biting comment, a rough glare? Hurry and love are oil and water. They simply do not mix. Hence, in the Apostle Paul's definition of love, the first descriptor is patient eight. There's a reason people talk about walking with God, not running with God. It's because God is love. In his book Three Mile an Hour God, 
The late Japanese theologian Kasu Koyama put this language around it. God walks slowly because he is love. If he is not love he would have gone much faster. Love has its speed. It is an inner speed. It is a spiritual speed. It is a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are accustomed. It is slow yet it is lord over all other speeds since it is the speed of love 9 in our culture slow is a pejorative. When somebody has a low IQ, we dub him or her slow. When the service at a restaurant is lousy, we call it slow. When a movie is boring, again, we complain that it's slow. Case in point, Merriam-Webster, mentally dull. Stupid, naturally inert or sluggish, lacking in readiness. Promptness. Or willingness 10 the message is clear. Slow is bad, fast is good. But in the upside-down kingdom, our value system is turned on its head. Hurry is of the devil. Slow is of Jesus. Because Jesus is what love looks like in flesh and blood. The same is true for joy and peace, two of the other core realities of the kingdom. Love, joy, and peace are the triumvirate at the heart of Jesus' kingdom vision. All three are more than just emotions. They are overall conditions of the heart. They aren't just pleasant feelings. They are the kinds of people we become through our apprenticeship to Jesus, who embodies all three ad infinitum and all three are incompatible with hurry. Think of joy. All the spiritual masters from inside and outside the Jesus tradition agree on this one. If there's a secret to happiness, it's simple, presence to the moment. The more present we are to the now, the more joy we tap into. And peace, need I even make a case? Think of when you're in a hurry for your next event, running behind, do you feel the deep shalom of God in your soul? A grounded, present sense of calm and well-being. To restate, love, joy, and peace are at the heart of all Jesus is trying to grow in the soil of your life, and all three are incompatible with hurry. Again, if you don't believe me, next time you're dragging the family out the door. Pay attention to your heart. Is it love and joy and peace you feel? Of course not. At lunch my non-mentor mentor John wisely observed, I cannot live in the kingdom of God with a hurried soul. Nobody can. Not only does hurry keep us from the love, joy, and peace of the kingdom of God, the very core of what all human beings crave, but it also keeps us from God himself simply by stealing our attention. And with hurry, we always lose more than we gain. Here for the win, Walter Adams, the spiritual director to C.S. Lewis. To walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances at eleven meaning. Very little can be done with hurry that can't be done better without it, especially our lives with God, and even our work for God. Here from Ronald Rollheiser my undisputed favorite Catholic writer of all time, with hurricane force. Today, a number of historical circumstances are blindly flowing together and accidentally conspiring to produce a climate within which it is difficult not just to think about God or to pray, but simply to have any interior depth whatsoever. We, for every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. It is not that we have anything against God, depth, and spirit. We would like these. It is just that we are habitually too preoccupied to have any of these show up on our radar screens. We are more busy than bad, more distracted than non-spiritual, and more interested in the movie theater, the sports stadium, and the shopping mall and the fantasy life they produce in us than we are in church. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives 12 I love Rawlheiser's turn of phrase. Pathological busyness. Again, a certain level of busyness is fine or at least unavoidable. There's even a time and place for hurry in a 911 caliber emergency. When your wife's water breaks or your toddler runs into the street. But let's be honest, those moments are few and far between. The pathological busyness that most of us live with is our default setting. The chronic hurry we assume is normal. It's far more, well, pathological. As in the technical sort. A pathogen let loose into a mass population. Resulting in disease or death. We hear the refrain I'm great. Just busy so often we assume pathological busyness is okay. After all, everybody else is busy too. But what if busyness isn't healthy? What if it's an airborne contagion, wreaking havoc on our collective soul? Lately I've taken to reading poetry, which is new for me. But I love how it forces me to slow down. You simply can't speed read a good poem. Last night I picked up the Christian savant and literary master T.S. Eliot. A little of it I even understood. Like his line about this twittering world where people are distracted from distraction by distraction 13 meaning a world with just enough distraction to avoid the wound that could lead us to healing and life. Again, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. As Ortberg has said, for many of us the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. 14. Do you see what's at stake here? It's not just our emotional health that's under threat, as if that's not enough. We move so fast through life that we're stressed out, on edge, 
quick to snap at our spouses or kids. Sure, that's true, but it's even more terrifying. Our spiritual lives hang in the balance. Could it be that Willard was right? That an over-busy, digitally distracted life of speed is the greatest threat to spiritual life that we face in the modern world? I can't help but wonder if Jesus would say to our entire generation what he said to Martha. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only 1.15 the need of the hour is for a slowdown spirituality 16.